Okay. Well, today we get to meet one of my favorite biohacking superheroes, Kristen Weitzel. She just, just thinking of her actually brings to mind Wonder Woman. So Kristen is the founder of Warrior Woman Mode. She is a health and high performance maven, nutrition specialist, certified fitness trainer, and exposure therapy coach. And she'll explain what that is in a minute. Part of her gift to the world is to open people up to the physical and emotional expansion of breath work and cold exposure. There's another hint. She's literally the ice queen. So Kristen also hosts the Well Power podcast, which blends biohacking and wellness subject matter expertise and, and really inspiring guests. And we, we learned just how far we can go in the pursuit of optimal performance with Kristen. So you've got to listen to this. She is truly a progressive voice for women in the biohacking space, trailblazing the path for the rest of us. And she's a dynamic leader who speaks at so many health events, including the Biohacking Congress and Dave Asprey's Biohacking Conference, just to name a couple. And she's September Biohacking Conference in September. I'm speaking on cold. Again. Woo. Yeah, in September 2022, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like the weekend of the 19th and I'm talking all things cold. Oh my Last God. time I talked women's biohacking this time and I was excited about it. And this time I'm like, so stoked to talk about cold. You are, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're the ice queen and yeah. you are a badass. So without further ado, let's meet this wonder woman. <laughs> so welcome, Kristen. Thanks for having me, Zora. I'm so glad to be here with you. We have so much intermingling in our lives uh, across all planes of health and wellness, and we get to get a little time today together. I we really believe- need to do like in-person coffee bro down or whatever, hoe down. Someone said to call it a hoe down, but I just feel like that's a little bit odd. Um, <laughs> yeah, like we'll get there we, one day. We, Happy to be here. we have to do an ice bath. Like, you know, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm, I, I'm shocked that I haven't had you on the podcast yet. Like this is, this is really bad. Um, but I'm finally got you here and I, I'm so, so glad because we do have some parallel lives and have very, very similar beliefs. And I'm just so excited to share you with my audience. And I, and if they don't know you, they will certainly never forget you now. <laughs> so let's, let's first hear your version of what biohacking is and how you got into this space, because I, I, I know that, you know, my audience are biohacking women 50 plus, but I'm sure there are plenty out there who go, what is biohacking? Yeah. The biohacking thing is interesting, isn't it? Because so many people have sort of different definitions. And then I I talk a lot about, uh, sometimes it's like easier to say what it's not, Um, but (laughs) Because Instagram is so interesting. People are like, you know, it's a, it's a butt shot on the beach and, you know, seagulls in the background and they're like, hashtag biohacking. And you know what? Like if someone gives the right context, then this is what everything is about in, in the fitness and wellness world is what is your context? And we will talk about that today. It's like, cool. Did you go to the gym and do a whole bunch of specific style, tempo, st- tempo style squats during your estrogenic period of your cycle? And then you're outside in nature. And like, maybe that's all the biohacking that got you that booty peach with the seagulls in the background, or maybe you just want an ass shot hashtag. And it feels like, okay, but you know, it's, it, it is biohacking in some ways. I just, I don't like to abuse the term too much. I do think it's important to make it approachable because it's not going away. And um, we don't love the hacking wor- word always, you know, just generally speaking, some people are like, but hacking sounds like I'm taking a shortcut or it's dangerous. And really for me, biohacking is using ancient practices all the way up through modern technology and these innovations that we have uh, come across or shown up in the world and picking and choosing the things that are going to shift your state externally and internally in order to feel better, faster, stronger, smarter, healthier, so we can all live longer. And that's, that's, it's not about living longer for the sake of living longer. I think it's about living longer so we can really get the meat out of the fruit of life. And that's, um, that's a lot of what my journey is about. And that's what I want. I work with predominantly females, but men and women and athletes alike. I, I think getting the, the meat out of life contextually for our own goals is the most important thing that we can lean in. Ooh, Claudia, great question. Ancient practices like breath work even today, speaking about cold, like we are not, no one alive today is the first person to be doing breath work or cold exposure. 
And those practices have been around for thousands of years. And it's super beautiful that they're coming more into fashion again uh, for, for many of the places in the world that never had cold exposure. You know, if you look at Scandinavia and you look at Asia, they've been doing cold practices and therapies forever. Naked yeah. even. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I heard about your trip to Finland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I love the fact uh, that you brought in the ancient practices because a lot of people think about biohacking, you know, we're using biology to hack our body or do something different, but they always think it's just some, some supplement or some super drug or some, you know, gadget. And, you know, we, although we use those things, you know, we, we really do have that foundation. And, and I, I love to, to, I think these hacks are quote unquote hacks or these shortcuts or, you know, these are more like, like a supplement to an already healthy diet and lifestyle. We have that foundation of the breath work or the ice bathing or the, you know, the, the community that we have, the nutrition, the sport, all that stuff. I mean, it really needs to be there and that base, that strong foundation. And then all those other little extra things of PRP or, you know, some, some extra, you know, um, I don't know, nootropics or some supplements, you know, those are kind of icings on the cake and they work. They are miracles when you have that foundation, but if you don't, a lot of people just want to cut to the chase and get straight to that, that thing, that hack. And then the glamorous, the glamorous yeah. stuff. Yeah. And it doesn't work or kind of, kind of works, not really. And that's because they don't have that foundation. So I really love that people like you are, are bringing that, exposing that and, and showing that it's not just some shortcut. So how did you get into the biohacking space? I mean, it's a long and winding road. Um, I won't go, I'll make the long story short. I was a dancer. I was around a lot of body dysmorphia. And then mm. I started getting really curious about what kind of food I could put in my body and still have the energy. I basically was like, what can I, how can I still eat some of the crap I was eating and some of the things that I love and not, uh, st and stay within the, the ballerina physique that I sort of needed to have in order to stay in the dance world. And I also was like burning calories at a decent high, a decently high rate as a kid, as we do. And, um, I just really wanted to know how to like keep the energy to be able to do it all on that you know, later on showed up in my life in ways where, you know, I needed to understand how to quell some alpha energy from, um, so I have, I have quite a bit of energy. I think I figured out a lot of the ways to boost that energy, but I just, I, I wove myself through a 10 year plus 10, 15 year corporate career. And I was the chick who was kind of made fun of drinking butter coffee and, um, you know, d discovering Dave Asprey, discovering Bulletproof. I, I started even before Dave, I was like really, a a uh, reader of Mark Sisson's work and the whole, the, the primal movement that was like around food, but also physical well-being and getting sun. And I mean, Mark really had so much of it, right? And what I loved about Mark was I was a performing arts major. And so, and, and I went to performing arts high school. And so what I loved about Mark was like, I didn't have a lot of science in my schooling and background in the university level. I took like theories of light and sound. I wasn't, I wasn't taking science or biology or biochem and Mark would read these oodles and oodles amounts of amount of research and then just to distill it down into like a very intelligently written but approachable like blog post mm -hmm. and that that really set me spinning into other ways I could like lean into optimizing my wellness and tried a lot of things and failed at some things you know as as we do right because we have to understand like I was talking about in the opening context like what is our context are we a man? Are we a woman in the world? Physiologically, are we, you know, training for a triathlon? Are we trying to look good naked? Are we wanting to be like power lift the 500 pounds or, you know, what's our contact play a sport? What's our context? So, yeah. So it became fascinating to me and it's sort of become a lifelong, not sort of, it's become a lifelong study. Um, I'm, I'm a student of nutrition and I'm a nutrition specialist and I guide people with nutrition and I, I've, certified to coach people and fitness training. And it's, I'm always learning and always applying new things. Um, most recently running, which is a, a, a wild challenge for me to layer into my life. And, right. um, yeah, like a marathon sort of a, when I want to run a, well, run a marathon or I will say this really briefly, which is I have a very close friend of mine, uh, who I love dearly. His name is Will. He lives in Australia. He is running across the continent to raise awareness for veterans, uh, PTSD, suicidal tendencies, anxiety, stress, things like that. 
and the continent of Australia is massive and he's running, uh, he's running it in three months. So 55 kilometers a day, which is, uh, it's like an ultra a day. Wow. And so a year and a half ago, he called me and said, I'm going to do this. And I was like, cool. And he said, I'm going to invite like five people to do a leg with me. And I want you to be one of them. And I thought, awesome. No problem. It's a year and a half away. <laughs> um, and I finally just booked my flight seven days ago. Cause he's been training for 18 months and he's doing so well. And I am, um, I'm running seven days in a row with him. He'll run 55 K my attempt for me will to be to run a marathon a day, seven days in a row. So, uh, probably maybe I'll do more, maybe I'll do less. There is a uh, support car. So if I feel like I need to take a breather, I can, which I think is, um, an intelligent way for me to be able to say yes and wholeheartedly cheerlead him on and support him in that process and endeavor without putting myself or his record at risk, because mm -hmm. I have, um, not been a lifelong runner. She's certainly athlete and advocate of fitness, but, uh, running that many miles takes some things to learn. So I'm learning them all now. I'm jumping rope. I'm wearing water vests. I'm running in the street. I don't know what I'm doing. It's awesome. <laughs> making me, it's making me learn. Like this is the, this is the way we keep our mind fresh. So I love it. I, this is, this is so great. It's so inspiring. I, for, to start off with, I have to, uh, recognize that yeah mark sisson was somebody that's how i fell into their sort of this area and i completely didn't think about it until you just said it and mm -hmm. he was great he has a i don't know I, I'm, I'm not sure if i'm following his blog anymore but mark's daily apple it was fantastic i don't know if he's still doing it but i learned so much from him and i absolutely agree that that that's a, that was a pretty good starting point that launched me as well towards the biohacking space but yeah. I love that you decided to take on this challenge. Um, very much like me, I, I last year I well I was agreed to do a bike ride for um, AIDS Life Cycle from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Yeah, with a friend who has done it before. He convinced me to do it, and I I had to drop out because I got invited to the the biohacking congress, and so he said come back next year. So. I plan to do that next year uh, <laughs> and see, and I'm the same. I'm not a bike rider. I, you know, this is a new thing, but I think the, the fun thing is, is learning and seeing how far your body can go. And like you said, you know, if you can't do it or don't pressure yourself, there's always the car <laughs> that can help take you away. Um, but you certainly try your best. I think I, I love that. So I, I'm going to be following you on that, on that journey. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. It's exciting. And for anyone who's like listening to this, you know, and, and Claudia and Shannon, I love you, Shannon. So nice to see you here after just seeing you a week or so ago. Um, I, this is the thing in life, right? I, this is like, I, I get more and more into this at this, uh, this context thing, but it's like, I, I'm coaching all these women. I'm doing all these ice baths. I'm doing breath. I don't need motivation to do that. Like, I don't, I don't, I, I some days it's like harder than others, but I don't, I'm stoked to get and figure out what I can do with the gears in my breathing or how I can make myself dizzy or what, whatever. Right. I'm, I'm stoked to get in the cold water. I don't have like a fear around that because I know how healthy the practice can be for me. And that being said, sometimes in life, we need something to show up and it doesn't just show up because randomly it shows up. Let's be clear. It's happening for you. It shows up your life cycle, this run for me. It, when it was presented to me, I was like, how I can't, how can I do that? I'm, I'm coaching people. I'm really good at all these other things, but I'm going to go run in like Australia and it's going to be hot and challenging. And this showed up surely because it, it makes me put context back to my life. And instead of just like coaching people and keeping myself at the status quo of my health, it's pushing me to do something. And it was so scary to make the choice and book the plane ticket that, and, and like, also it's scary for me. Meanwhile, look what Will's doing. So like no, 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 you know, no shortage of like inspiration, for this guy I'm going to go run with, but that showed up because I put context back in my life. So I could put context back in my life and then find my edges because we get a little comfy sometimes. And so now here's this thing. And I run into friends that are like, what are you doing? Are you going to be okay? And, and that is fine to have that response. And also they're like, okay, five minutes later, like, okay, I'm coming around. I know you, you're not gonna, I can't talk you out of it. So how can I support you? Like, what do you need? Or, you know, here's what I know about running or whatever it might be. And so that's, that's really beautiful to, to see that and to say it out loud even feels 
uh, almost like a, in, imposter syndrome. Like I'm saying it out loud and I'm running and I'm jumping rope and I'm like, am I doing this? It's I'm three days into training. I have eight weeks. I'm booking a plane. I'm getting on the, I'm getting on the road with him. So I got to do the work. And that, that message is just something I want to share with people that sometimes these things show up that feel like challenges. You know, if someone tells you to go, come jump off a brin, bit bridge and you're super scared and it's like a bungee thing and maybe maybe that's not the thing for you, we all want to make autonomous, intelligent decisions. And if you feel like there's some measure of safety there and it's scary, take a good look at it before you say no, because it might be the thing that is getting you to leap and the net will appear, right? This is cold exposure for many people is this scary. Yeah. And so- Actually, yeah. this, yeah, this is a very great analogy, you know, just taking that leap of faith for doing a cold exposure, right? And you just make that decision, you're going to do it, not do it. And, and sometimes the journey or the anticipation could be great or not so great, or, or you know, there's a lot of things we're going to discuss about the cold exposure now. So I want to, I want to, you to explain, first of all, what is cold exposure or cold therapy in, in general, and to give people a little bit of background. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it's been around, like I was saying earlier, cold water immersion, cold exposure, the, the key phrase being intentional or deliberate cold exposure. Uh, more and more I've been using as I, I run a training called Sherpa Breath and Cold for instructors. This is how I met Shannon. Well, it's not, we stalked each other on social media for a long time first, but um, it's how we got interwoven. And, and uh, I'm more and more been using this term intentional cold exposure because deliberate cold exposure is one thing, but like, I want you to apply your context to it context being physiology, age, what you're doing for sport, if you're using it for recovery, if you're using it for your salvation, whatever it might be, right? Your science or your woo, what's that context and making it intentional. Uh, people do ice swimming, people get in cold showers, people will get into cryotherapy chambers. Um, and I think even Claudia was mentioning here, is people are like, get jumping into the snow, uh, even just walking in a smaller, lighter amount of clothing in really cold weather, it can be a modicum of cold exposure. And so deliberate uh, or intentional is the important word. This is not about falling through a hole in the ice and getting um, hypothermic. It <laughs> is about you know taking care of yourself by utilizing cold as a tool or a variable for shape-shifting your health and optimizing it. So then what, what are the benefits in, and differences? Because there are differences between cryotherapy and ice bathing, for example. Yeah. What, do, what can yeah. people expect? What, why, why do this at all? Totally. That's what my mom was like. I don't quite understand still six years <laughs> of being putting yourself. You know, I used to take my mom to like the Korean spas in New York City. And, oh, the Jim Jill bangs. Oh I my God. Those. And I, I loved it like 18, 19 years old. And I, I loved it. And I always was like, the cold is titillating and it's so crazy. And I think I thought it was like edgy, which it is in some ways, but I didn't know how to breathe through it. Or I didn't know how to manage it. And there would be like, even like when I was in LA, there'd be like two little girls of the owners or something in the cold water. And they'd be like, we're being popsicles. And they're all excited. I'm like, How are these girls tolerating this, you know? And, um, it's just, it's the most, it's the most beautiful practice to get immersed in water. And I say that first, not because if all you have accessible is a cold shower, which I live in Texas, the water's not cold. Um, I mean, it's cool, but if, I, if all you have is a cold shower and if all you have is access to a cryotherapy unit, then cool, then do that. Amazing. You can get benefits of it that are around sleep, around um, mitigating some of your DOMS. So if you're like working out or strength training, you can get a reduction in delayed onset muscle soreness that you might see, you know, that thing that happens like a day or two after you work out, um, a mood boosting for sure. And that's a really big one, especially in females being more susceptible, physiological females being more susceptible to sleeplessness, anxiety, and stress rumination. That's a neurochemical thing in our genetic makeup because we're more susceptible. And as we age that seems and tends to increase in the literature that we see, there is a huge mood boosting effect of cold showers and cryotherapy and cold water immersion across the board. And so th for those reasons, it's always going to be beneficial. That being said, I encourage everyone to find a way that they can incorporate some sort of ice bathing immersion practice into their life. Because when you look at some of the literature and the science, recognizing that it's a little bit all over the place, nothing says it's going to kill you. Um, 
everything is, is mostly in a positive direction. The challenges always become, is it like my half my body or up to my waist or up to my neck or women of a certain age or many, many men, which they've used a lot in the science, um, only menopausal women or uh, only young college age guys. And it's like enough college men, let's get some more women in the water and then temperature and then time. So it could, there's so many variables to play with, right? And these, these researchers are always doing a beautiful job of saying, okay, we have to quadrant down to a certain person type. And then we have to really make it strict and structured to be able to actually publish, publish the research. But what we see is cold water immersion across the board is where all the longevity benefits live, where the mitochondrial health and function improves, where the um, brown adipose tissue is made Many, many people who are like brown adipose tissue, what is that? So adipose tissue is the fatty tissue of the body. Science will say there's some more, but let's just say there's three types. There's visceral fat, that's the fat around our organs that we need um, to be healthy for our organs to be protected. And there is white fat and there is brown fat. And for all intents and purposes, again, a generalization, but there's beige fat too, but we won't go into it. There's, there's white fat. And when women come to me and say, I wanna lose weight, they don't wanna lose weight. They want to lose body fat, right? As we get older and we have, we become more sarcopenic. That just happens as our hormones shift into perimenopause and menopause. Sarcopenia is just our muscles. We have some muscle wasting if we don't do the things to mitigate that. And we, we want, and this can sometime raise our fat content. That's all white fat. Brown fat is a good fat. Brown fat is the fat you have uh, on your body as a baby. It's the thing that make, you know, toddlers crawling across the room, all chubby kin style looks so cute. And it's mostly across the back of the shoulders, certain areas in the body that helps with thermoregulation. It is really mitochondrially dense. And so it's energy and it is just gloriousness for your body to be able to live into a bit of its better, better self, meaning upregulating up your cellular health helping with immune response, lots of different things that happen there. So usually when people are like, I'm never getting an ice bath. And then I tell them how the metabolism boosts and how the brown fat burns white fat off your body faster. I can't even finish the sentence. And they're like in the ice bath <laughs> under the water. <laughs> that's exactly yeah. the same technique I, I use because that's the immediate response that we get. <laughs> It's no. fat, yeah. but yeah, explaining it, you explained that so well, actually, because a lot of people don't know, yeah, what the difference between brown fat and white fat and just, you know, you're, you're burning fat and that's, that's really good. So, yeah. you know, we, we can get some of these great benefits and, and definitely, like you said, you know, activating those longevity genes and all these longevity, uh, pathways are, are certainly activated and, I'm just fascinated as well about the, the expo actually the, this is the first podcast I have on cold exposure and ice bathing and shockingly, because I, I'm so into it myself, but I rarely talk about it. So I, uh, I mean, I post things on Instagram and all that, but I think this is a, a great chance to explain a little bit more in detail what that is and what that looks like. So uh, we got some of the benefits. Are there any other key benefits that you wanted to point out? I mean, I here's the thing I will say that the, that is the biggest benefit in many cases that I see, we have all these physiological benefits. They're amazing. We have mood boosting benefits. Wonderful. It helps with sleep. Lots of people having tough times sleeping, um, thermal regulation. When we talk about, you know, perimenopause and menopause, hot flashes, things like that. There's some studies showing lots of them in rats, but st studies showing even with women, um, there's a couple of groups, I think 50 women, uh, over in Finland or something that in a study I was just reading about, just talking about the massive benefits of thermal regulation by getting in cold when they're dealing with hot flashes. Remember that study I sent to you as well, the ones in the Baltic Sea in Poland, they were all- Oh, that's it. I'm sorry, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ones, that, it's it. It's in Poland, not what I say, Finland. Oh, so I'm addicted to Oh, Finland. was that one? Yeah, yeah that, was, that was an incredible study. I mean, I was. it wasn't huge, but they were mostly menopausal women. And yeah. so we're gonna talk about, yeah, the, the menopausal women, because the question is, you know, should- older women be doing this? Like maybe you want to share a little bit what, what the study showed. Yeah. I mean, the, the, when you're talking about thermoregulation, I mean, there's, there's a lot to unpack. Um, when you're talking about thermoregulation of, and hot flashes, right. Which come in, in menopause. And when I look at the things that happen to our body as we get perimenopausal and menopause, I always, I'm like perimenopause, we got to keep it in the mix when we're talking about it, because it's 
becoming a longer and longer journey. Women are falling into perimenopause sooner. And if they cannot mitigate that time of their life, sometimes perimenopause is lasting years. And so this is, uh, in my opinion, and maybe we're seeing some of this in the research is like, there's a lot of environmental factors and, and toxins and things like that. And if we're not getting those detoxed or out of our bodies, they can, they can contribute to that. But when I look at those things, when I look about, when I look at sleeplessness, when I look at the, um, the, the body losing, it's not that we lose capacity to thermoregulate, right? It's like the, the, our body is like sending a signal over and over and over again to make more estrogen. And that's, what's making us hot. It's like, it's, it, that's the perimenopausal thing of hot flashes. And so it's like, Hey, make more brain, brain, make more estrogen, make more estrogen. And, and the body's like revving up all its systems and all its hormones to do that. And then it's like checking in with the, with the estrogen levels. And it's like, Oh, I guess we didn't make enough. Let's send more signals. And so that's creating the heat, but it is a, it is a very challenging thing and a little bit, um, intense. Let's just say that from the women that I, I work with that were experiencing hot flashes all the way in and through menopause in some cases to, to manage. And, you know, there's people will talk about black cohosh and lots of things to work on, but there's a big piece of this cold exposure thing. That's what's te teaching our body how to regulate temperature better. Meaning if you're going to have extreme temperature fluctuation, your body is more equipped to deal with it. Um, and so, and the one other thing I want to say about this, this age category and benefits, which is not exactly addressing the question you asked, but I'm going to say it anyway, is it's an interesting time of life as we get you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, where I think if there's part of us that like potentially is like, you know what? I don't care about what people think anymore. I'm going to do what I damn well want. I got a life behind me. I have successes and excellence. I've, you know, put practices into play. Um, hopefully we still have a growth mindset. <laughs> that being said, it's, it's a time where we think a lot about, okay, I can stand in my own power as a woman, as a wise woman. And there is also a, a thing societally that, that we see that is a little bit of this shame dynamic and the cutting down of women of a certain age, right? We see it in Hollywood. We see it all over, <laughs> all over the place. And it, it's again, goes back to the thing that I, that I see with clients, no matter what age, especially females that I'm working with, which is what we think about ourselves when we look at, look at a reflection in the mirror. And so you're wondering how does this have to do with cold? But the reality is the, the number one thing that I see with cold exposure is that women, especially women, 40, 50, 60, step back into themselves, like into their badass selves. Like I already know that I don't have to like be so affected by what other people think because I have a life of experience to really beautifully, you know, be, be in and be kind and not worry about how it's coming back at me and, you know, parry off the stuff. It doesn't feel good and all of that. But then women in, perimenopausal menopausal years get in the cold and it's like doing a, I used to put like six-year-old women in handstands when I was a young yoga teacher and I didn't even understand why they would like leave the room some days like they had just had sex like they were like oh that was amazing even against the wall right we're just up against the wall but it's like we stop doing the play in some ways and we stop living a little part of our like rock star inner selves and then when I get women in the water for the first time who maybe haven't done something extreme like that they step Auto, almost automatically right back into their badass, right back into their, that, that little glimmer of them that was like, maybe, well, I guess I'm too old for that, right? Like you and I, we don't like to ever say that. We don't ever want to say like, I'm too old for cold or I'm too old to do this thing. But there is a small little voice in our head from society shunting us to the side a little in some ways as we hit 40 that we're like, well, maybe, maybe I should just be smaller. And we've spent our whole lives. And this is all I do with coaching is trying to not have people be smaller. And then we, we have another instance of it when we hit our forties, fifties, and sixties. And it's, that sucks. And I want people to not have that. And it's not, it's not a judgment on anyone because this is like what the world is. And it's like, also as our psychology grows, we start wondering about our mortality in life. And then I put people in cold and they're like, right back in it, new context, standing strongly in their own power that they already had. And then also feeling like the mental toughness and clarity. And in many cases, the mood boosting effects that make them soar, that help you step back into the full expression of the person or the female that you are. And so I know I didn't exactly answer the question. I'm all down about the research and what I see putting over 2000 bodies in the ice, like most people one-on-one, -on -one, it's just, 
It's incredible. It's like an incredible shape-shifting transformational practice that when people are like, well, it's just ice, it's just edgy. It's just on social media. Lady Gaga is doing it. I want to say, you know, that's not, it is so much fucking bigger than that. If you could just sit, if you sit and watch all these bodies that I've watched going in and out of the cold, like I know Shannon is, who's on this call is seeing this too with people that she's working with because she, she's in the industry, but it's really, it's breathtaking. It is. I'm so glad. No, I know that this is such an important point that you added. So I, and I absolutely agree. And you explained it so eloquently because what I, what I was going to say is the biggest thing that I see when I get people also in the ice bath, because I used to do health retreats in Thailand. That's where I first really, I was had my first ice bath and really sort of understand it. And I was watching the the practitioner bring my clients in there and out. And I just saw hundreds of people, not only my clients, but just other guests in the hotel and, and, and every time. So you get these people in the ice bath, they come out so empowered. And that's what I felt as well, because it's that, especially that first time it's that anticipation yeah. is just horrible. Like, is it going to hurt? That's all I asked. I was like, is it going to hurt? <laughs> like, is it painful? And, and the instructor said, yes. <laughs> he said, yeah. So that's the number one question I get people standing at the side of the tub before they go in. And I think it's just, they're trying to delay what's about to happen. And they just will literally look up at me and be like, it's cold. It's going to be cold. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you know, it's going to be cold. We're here for it. Yeah. yeah. But so I, I did feel that ex- myself and I saw it in every single person who came out of that is, wow, if I can do this, I can do anything. All yeah. those other things that you had doubts about for some reason are, are, you know, there's no doubt anymore. And that's, I loved that about the ice bath. It really empowered people. And I had all kinds of people who had fibromyalgia or had uh, body image issues or had depression or had, you know, and they just came out with a completely different perspective and they would go over and over and over again, kept going in. And, yeah. and it, it's, it's funny because you think, well, it's, it's uncomfortable. Right. And then, but they, they see the benefit, they feel the benefit. So I would say for me, the biggest benefit or the thing that I really noticed right away was that empowerment. And that just stays with you for the rest of your life. I think that's, everybody's got to try it at least once and yeah. to, to feel that, but why don't you explain a little bit what, what an ice bathing experience looks like and feels totally. like if you, otherwise people go on Google, you have to go, go see it, but I'd like to through it all. Yeah. So there's, there's it. a lot of different ways to do it, right? That let's just, we'll briefly touch on this one fact, which is if you want to start and you're nervous about submerging yourself in water, you start with a cold shower. And the goal of the cold shower is to get to a place where you turn it on cold, only cold, and you go three minutes in and then you get out and you never have warm. Now you can start with contrasting or if you're gonna get up in the morning and you gotta get ready for work or whatever, you can soap your whole body down and then turn it to cold and contrast and all of that. If you have a bathtub in your house, easy peasy way, inexpensive way to go get ice. But really, you know, and then there are people that that stack into like, I'm starting to fall in love with ice. Where do I go next? And I would say typically it's putting a trough in a metal or plastic trough in your backyard, or people will convert a um, chest freezer quite often, which sounds a little wacky, but it's actually really uh, an an inexpensive, very effective way to get cold exposure on demand without having to like buy all the ice and schlep all that. Because once you've done that for years, you get over it pretty quickly. Um, My friend, John Richter, who's here in Texas has a like a $14 ebook or something. And it's like, it's called uh, the chest freezer, cold plunge.com or something. And it just tells you how to convert any chest freezer really easily. Cause he's made, admittedly, he says uh, he's made every mistake in the book. And so he wants you to avoid all that. Um, and then we get to like where the, you know, the, the jam of this, which is what does a cold bath feel like and, and look like, and it's, it's typically a, a tub of some nature, a vessel. Um, if you're lucky enough to live in a country, continent, or time zone where there is um, winter and ice and ice swimming and things like that. It's absolutely uh, completely and totally available to you all the time or during specific seasons, you can do it outdoors. I I always like to remind people not to do it outdoors alone. Uh, You don't, the, the way that ice can cut your body, the way that the water moves, the way you can get, you know, it's just, there are some safety precautions to take there. So do it with a buddy, but you want to use water that is 
preferably in the range of ish sub 40 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe three degrees Celsius or less. We want it to be cold. And that's where there is a range again in the research, but where we're seeing most of the benefits is we're activating these cold shock proteins. And so it has to be cold enough in some way. And there's a, uh, there's a chart for that in some way, right? There's like a, an imaginary chart that is how, how cold is the water and how much time are you staying in? And what is a minimum effective dose for you? If you live in a hot climate and you're acclimatized and you're adapted to heat really well, that's awesome, but you may be less adapted to cold. If you are going from the house, if you live in Arizona and you're going from your house to your car, to the office, to your car, to the restaurant, to the, you're always in these, these wonderfully temperate, air conditioned environments and, and ice water is gonna feel cold to you. So what is cold to you is important to know and what the time is and what the temperature is. And the ice bath will have, I mean, if you're buying ice, this is a big question. If you're buying ice for yourself, this sounds like an astronomical amount, but dilution and melt rate and all of that. It's like, you want, get a friend cause you don't wanna go get all this ice and do it alone. Then be like, I have this great big ice bath and no one's here to do it with me or do it with your family. Um, eight, at least 80 pounds of ice is, is typically what I say to start. It doesn't mean you can't go get like 30 pounds and try it and just temp it down a little, but at least 80 pounds of ice, hundreds better for a solo person and couple or a couple people to do. And how, um, how much do, I mean, this is, I, I'm not in the US, but so does a bag of ice, is it one big bag is a 10 pounder or, and how much does that cost? And you get eight well, of those or three pound, they, they separate ice in three pounds, seven pounds and 10 pounds, depending on what kind of party supply grocery, whatever you're going to. So you just have to do the math on it. Um, I have this beautiful speaking of John Richter, who's the chest freezer guy. He's a super nerd. And he like made this chart that he just gave me permission to use Oh Shannon. I need to share it with you. I don't think I did yet, but it's permission to use, which is like, how many bodies are going in? What's the temperature of the air outside? How long is your experience going to be? And it's like the cheat sheet on how much ice you need to buy, but three pounds, seven pounds, 10 pound bags, got to do the math to just divide what it is. And I would say, you know, it's like a hundred pounds to get, you can run like five people through hundred, 150 pounds over a course of an hour. Or so ish, depending on how hot it is. And if you're in the shade or whatnot, but, and then there's like an ice or a vessel or a tub filled with ice water. And once you fill it all up, then that's where the, the magic happens is you have to get in it. And that part is, um, to me, it's a direct correlation on understanding your nervous system and utilizing breath to reverse engineer the nervous system so that you can get in the cold and master it. And you don't have to be perfect at it. And everyone on the planet's physiology or nervous system will have a response when they step in wildly cold water you're going to have something like oh, takes a little bit of your breath away that will, as you adapt and you get used to it, you will start to be able to step in and not have that anymore. It doesn't mean that you're not having a sympathetic nervous system response it's still happening. It's still cold. Your body's going to recognize that that's what our bodies do so well is keep us alive. And so really understanding how to utilize the breath we've in the age of Wim Hof, we've seen a lot of different breathing styles. None of them are wrong. Um, this is a really big thing in, in the industry. I see, I, I'm a firm believer in rising tide lifts all boats. You know, I teach an instructor training around breath and cold water, and I am super passionate about the category and I love Wim's work. So thankful for him. Um, the reason I set up my training is I wanted people to know all the crayons on the crayon box, all the colors on the palette they could paint with when it came to breath and cold, because you, I can get used to a specific style of cold plunging. And you might be like, great, I did it six times. It's not hard anymore. Or I did it 30 times. It's not hard anymore. You can always titrate up. You can always find ways to do advanced protocols and you can always shift the breath work in order to um, utilize and make some of those changes. And so how do we find all of the masters in this world and all of the people who are doing this really well and learn from them all. And that's what I tried to put together was a training of people could be like, it's, I'm not here to teach you the Kristen Weitzel method of breathing in cold water. I'm here to tell you all about the beautiful practice and then everything I know, and then you can take it and run it with it and say, this is what I like to do. So I always start with people two minutes in the ice. Um, I love a three minute, <laughs> I say two, but like Shannon will attest to this as she's here because it's like two. And then it's like, actually, I'm just going to run the clock for you to three. 
but we got to start with a goal and it, this is a you against you. It's a PR. It's not about what Tony does or Joe Rogan does or Mary down the block does, you know, Juanita does. It's not about any of that. It's about you. So what does it feel like to breathe yourself into feeling better standing by the ice bath? The anticipation is worse than the ice bath itself. <laughs> and then actually step in like leap there and have the net appear. And the net is you, the net is your breath and the capacity that you actually have in your body is way more than you even know. So that's kind of what it feels like as an overview. Yeah, no, thank you for explaining that just because people are visual. Uh, we, when I first did the ice bath, this was in Thailand. Mm. And so it was great that it wasn't in you know Finland, we get out of the, you know, we go out of the bath and we're in sunshine. But every time, so I didn't know anything about about the ice bath back then. So, but with every client, he made us go in for 20 minutes, 20 minutes. And so I thought, oh, wait, that's normal. And then eventually he worked me up to 45 minutes and I'm all proud of myself. Oh, I'm 45 minutes. And then as I start reading literature, I start learning more about it. I, I realize, oh my God, it's not the more, the better. You start to have diminishing returns after a certain point. So what would you say is the ideal amount of time in, uh, and this was four degrees, I'm talking about four degrees um, Celsius. I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit, but you know, if you were in something about a four degrees, then what is the ideal um, amount of time to be in there? Yeah. If you're, if you're in that like sub 40 range, if let's just say you're in anything from like two to six degrees or that and 36 to 44 degrees or something like that in that range, there is, um, the ideal time for each person is contextually really bio-individual, like a lot of biohacking. That being said, you know, starting with like a, let me work to two minutes, can I get to three is a great place to start. But the reality is you have to play with this like it's an adventure. And when you get out, you want to have your body have a shiver response. Now that shiver response is not one that exists. If you take it too long and you go to failure, like, I think I told you my Finland story. I mean, I didn't die, but I was like cold air temperature. Sauna wasn't working. Assumed it was working, got out of the cold and wow, it was a lot, right? You have to do things. There's things you can do with your body to heat, warm up your body. So it's fine. But, um, really, you know, understanding what it feels like to get to a shiver point. And that is, you're getting out of the bath. Maybe you're having a light shiver, even start in the ice bath and you're getting out and you're having, uh, if you haven't had a shiver response in, in, in the first five minutes, then maybe you can titrate up next time. Maybe you have no shiver response. You know, there's people is like, a John Welburn, who's like an ex NFL player is like, I don't ever shiver. And I'm like, I can make you shiver, <laughs> but it's just about titrating down temp and up time and doing that smartly right? Let's not, we don't all need to bend greenfield it and put like red light on our balls and inject stuff in our system and all this stuff. Like we, as women, this is a big part of my platform talking about, we are equally sensitive as we are powerful. And that is part of our gift. And also we need to play in the space to understand that sensitivity and that your five minutes one day may set you into a shiver response and the five minutes the next day may not. And that is because of our allostatic stress load. What other stresses, stresses are going on in your life? What's the air temperature? And like, you know, how many smartphone things who yelled at you that day, if you're exhausted and you got shitty sleep, if you're not eating well, if you're trained for nine hours at the gym or whatever. So understanding that is important, but if we're going to start somewhere, I'd say start at a two minute mark around that temperature window, see how it feels and then titrate up and then increase the load, right? Increase the cold, increase decrease the time, I mean, increase the time and decrease the cold and play there. Three minutes, I think is pretty, I'd say 80% of the people I put in more than that. 90% of the people I put in are doing three minutes, two minutes. If not, um, I, I like to say, uh, you know, I haven't lost anyone yet. What I typically mean is I don't really have runners, meaning like someone who's like, I'm out and I'm, they're running away. You can kind of see it. And I've gotten to a place in my coaching where I feel like um, I'm right there. I'm not literally in it with you, although that's happened once or twice with people I know well. I don't climb into the ice bath with anyone I don't know well. Um, but I'm not literally in it with you, but I'm so I'm a I'm an incredible space holder. This is the thing that I've I've learned about myself. And I just watched a pad, podcast somewhere where some guy's like, what's space holding? That doesn't mean shit. We're all just saying this. And what is that? And I, it's like, cool, you don't want to use that term because it sounds too woo-woo. That's fine. 
and I am energetically everything, all my, all my life story, all my issues, all my traumas and everything, they are not present. They're out the door and they're to coach you. I'm fully turned with my switch on. And I am like there right next to that person going through what they're going through. And I've done a really appropriate intake. So I understand where their triggers might be. Um, especially if they're dealing with like water trauma from their past or anything like that. So part of the reason it's cool to get a coach or do this in a group is when people are holding space for you energetically and are there to support you. And if you get teary eyed or you get excited or you laugh or it's easy for you or whatever, they're just there. And so that's the really important thing for, you know, uh, why I say doing it in community, we have an oxytocin dump that really helps us bond with people when we're doing crazy things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, two to three minutes in that time window, uh, somewhere around there. And then around that 40 degree or four minute mark, uh, 40 degree Fahrenheit, four degree Celsius mark, uh, because a great place to start. And then you have like nowhere to go, but everywhere else. The thing you talked about that's the point of diminishing returns is when like Rogan sits in, I I hate, poor Joe Rogan. I mean, not really, but poor Joe Rogan, because I always use him as the example. He does one minute in the cold plunge and that's great. Cool. And then, you know, what happens is like he gets and he does it on social and then he gets off social. And then I'm sure like Jocko and Goggins and his whole crew are like, dude, one minute sucks. You better go back. You can, you can do better than that. What are you, you're not a man or whatever they say. And then he does 20 minutes live on Instagram in a cold plunge. And I think cool. Like he MMA and badass guy and you know, whatever he's trying to do. But what I don't love is like, I don't want it to deter people from trying because he's like, he's past the point of minimum effective dose of helping his body. And he's at point of diminishing returns like that. That is what you were talking about. Like you can go too far. And if you're like convulsing and shivering and having all the the responses, you know, not, not necessarily the place you want to go for longevity. And also that being said, Joe Rogan, if you're listening to this, call me tomorrow, let's sit next to each other in our forges and see who can go longer. I'm I'm up (laughs) for it. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's a gamification and there's super amounts of fun to be had and let's not put ourselves uh, into hypothermia, right? We have to like safety first. I'm sending this to him. We'll see if he takes on the challenge. (laughs) We'll see men versus women. (laughs) Let's see that. Um, okay. You've explained this so well. I'm so glad you, you, you mentioned that as well, because yeah, people will think the more, the better it's just not that way. And that's where biohacking too can really go wrong as well. So yeah. one thing I really want to stress for people, this is what I've seen is, is like you said, don't do this alone, uh, unless you're doing, you know, cold showers or whatever, but if you're going to go in an ice bath or jump in a lake or something, do it with an instructor. Right. And do with a good instructor. Fortunately, the guy that I was doing with, I don't think he was that great, but he somehow got everybody in. But do it with somebody. And I, so my question is I mean, people who are listening to this or don't live in Texas. Like, what if they want to do it with you? Do they have to fly out to you? Can you do it online? No, I do. I mean, I've done it online. I have plenty of clients I work with that they, um, uh, the furthest one I did was a woman in Indonesia who was like, let's do a nice plunge. And so she set up, so cute. She set up a, uh, like a little stereo speaker to have music. And then she set up the iPhone with her volume on like all around this. It was a chest freezer conversion. And I coached her through her first ice bath. And that was like super beautiful because that's so far away and in the other side of the world. And we can have that moment together. And she was like a little choked up after. And it was just really incredible. It's, it's, it's a little harder to do because you can't like hug it out after, yeah. but, um, but that was amazing. And, and now the, the cool thing is that I'm doing these Sherpa breath and cold instructor training. So I have a program that's here in Texas. I run community sessions and like private birthday parties, like I'm doing tonight and stuff to celebrate people. It's just a really nice non-alcoholic way to, you know, have a gathering of friends and do something exciting and exhilarating. And people can come to the trainings and, and, and the trainings are typically like, someone will call me and say, I have a gym, a space or an ice tub or whatever. And I have some coaches or friends or plant medicine facilitators or whatever it might be in the world. And they want to get together and contextually focus on breath work and cold exposure. And then I, then I come to you and that's how great is that? <laughs> that's so cool. I'm, I'm so, and actually, that's a great idea, a great party event. I never even thought about it, but absolutely. Why, why not? It's a healthy way to get people together 
And like you said, it's oxytocin, it's bonding. Yeah. You're going to leave that party with, you know, love and affection and empathy and compassion and, and just loving everybody without being high or smoking something or drinking too much. I mean, this is yeah. really, really a natural thing. I, I just was interviewed yesterday by Zico Health. Narando is a, a guy, a biohacker, and he, we, the whole topic was oxytocin. So I'm really oxytocin up right now. I, I love that hormone. And I think you absolutely hit it, the, the, hit it on the head, the nail on the head, because uh, what a great, great party thing. I, I want to, I want to, uh, before we, I want to open up the, the panel because I'm sure everybody has their questions right now. But before we do, I, I want to talk about a woman in her seventies and eighties, uh, even older. So is this safe physiologically? What's going to, is there going to be any difference happening physiologically to that person as opposed to a younger one? Um, yeah, good question. I mean, here's the thing, right? There's some contraindications more and more like people are yelling at the rooftops. If you had a cold exposure practice and you let's just talk about pregnancy. Cause we should talk about it. Even if we're talking about menopausal years, whatever, let's make sure people know there are some contraindications, um, really bad, like really challenging forms of diabetes. It doesn't mean I haven't seen people diabetic get in the cold. I just, they would say it's a contraindication, any major heart conditions, just understanding that shunting blood and vasoconstricting and all the things that happen in and out of the cold is important for you to just be okayed by your doctor to get in it. And with pregnancy, there are many, many people who are now saying, if you had a practice before you can have a practice again, I think it's very important that, you know, your practice is solid and stellar that you haven't had any fertility issues and that you are potentially maybe even taking the first trimester off. Like it's better safe than sorry, you know, your own body and everyone should do that um, as they see fit or their doctor sees fit because you're talking about carrying another life, right? You don't want to jeopardize that. So that being said, what do we do as we get older, right? There's so many pieces of this ice plunging practice that are maybe something like when you look at the weight room, we shy away from the weight room a little more um, generally speaking, as we age, and that's the thing we don't want to be doing and cold exposure, even if we've never done it before 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even has so many benefits, including like just mobility, right? You're, you're decreasing inflammation. You're decreasing inflammation in a way that is just going to help you move around in the world more effectively and efficiently. And Zora, what I see a lot is people will take in breath and cold. And if they don't have a perfect foundation of all the other things, they start to feel into like, oh, this feels good. I have more energy. I have more like my mood feels it like a little bit more excited to go out and make that big salad for dinner instead of ordering Chinese food or not the, Chi you know, not to slay Chinese food, but just making better choices about food and making better choices about going out for a walk and like getting into nature. I just interviewed this morning, a gentleman who is cold swimming and time in nature were the things that without chemo and radiation, hands down were the things that changed his entire life because he was like stage four leukemia, lymphoma, all, all of this stuff. And just like the doctors were like, um, we're throwing our hands up. Like he swam the Willamette river, like 180 miles over like a bunch of days, but he, they're like, it had to be the cold, you know, it had to be this time that that you spent in the cold that helped this, that helped the leukemia or like that dissipated leukemia. They couldn't even find it in his body anymore after this swim. And so I'm not here to tell you that it's going to cure everything, but I'm here to tell you that we have so many ailments that show up in our life later in, in life, that this is a practice that you don't want to ignore. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I think you're right. As people do shy away from it, they go on. I'm, I'm, I hate the cold, but I think sometimes we need to seek discomfort and see what happens, obviously. But let's open up the panel. If anybody has any questions, um, here we have some, some questions. I think we got most of them so far in the chat. Does anyone here have any extra questions? Um, Shannon, you, you wanna unmute at all? You're good? You can if you want, or oh, Claudia, okay. Shannon had a whole week with me answering every question, uh, <laughs> even more than she ever wanted to know about cold exposure. Or comments, comments too. It's nice to hear, especially people who worked with you, what they think about what's going on when you're in your practice too. Uh, can I, can I can I Hi. Sorry. Can I, can I speak? Yes, please. Uh, the increase in oxytocin is interesting for me because indeed I, I need a little bit of 
relaxation. And, but um, I have some spider veins on my legs, which appeared in my second pregnancy to, to increase in weight. What yeah. is therapy worsen these spider veins? I mean, the general answer is it's hard to say because I don't know everything there is to know about your body. But the reality is that if if There's my, some my strong belief system is that it will go in the physical. right direction, mm -hmm. you know, it's like most of we are having this thing where we like uh, we vasoconstrict and then we vasodilate, we shunt the blood the blood to the core of the body and back out to the periphery. So it's this huge detoxification that happens in the system. I know the extreme is, heat uh, affects those because I, I was said by a. Um, Aesthetician, I was used to wax my legs, and she, uh, an aesthetician, told me that uh, once that, uh, I should uh, stop waxing my legs because of this. I wonder if the cold, the extreme cold, would have the, a similar uh, effect. So I or, think, yeah, it's like, it depends on what's going on with that vein, if that vein is sort of shut down, or if there's a feasibility of sort of reinvigorating it by shunting yes, the blood. They through are, the but they, yeah, I don't know, maybe they can worsen, they can. I haven't seen that yet. Doesn't mean it's not possible. And the other thing I will say that, I don't know why this came some to people mind. have on their face, some people have on their face, those mm -hmm. uh, spider veins. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the, the, the other thing that's brought to mind, and it's not exactly correlated, but like just one other interesting thing that happens as we age is we become more insulin resistant. I know so the, that. the cold I really do. works in, in against that, right? It helps us build more insulin sensitivity. And even as I'm aging, I'm like, oh, my glucose response is very different now. It's like, I can see it changing and I'm like, oh, and the ice. I'm 55, oh. I'm, I yeah. respond much different than I responded to earlier. Yeah. Years. And so that's why we, you know, we titled this talk or Zora did this great job of saying, are we too old for cold? And I think that now no, more than ever is the time cold. i'm just <laughs> about my you know my appearance my i'm concerned <laughs> yeah of course and that this is a beautiful opportunity to like as you're shunting blood I, through your body and all of it to acknowledge is a is a useful therapy i have oh. heard many testimonies of including deva spray which suggests to uh, put the sh cold shower on the um, forehead and on the chest for 10 seconds to start with cold showers on the chest and on forehead, which is, is something I think I could do rather than plunging myself because of the legs. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can start there for sure. Your cheeks, your palms, yes. soles of your feet are the most sensitive. I don't cold. have any of those spider veins on my face or on, only on my legs. So Yeah, I would <laughs> do, I want to say this one thing to you, Claudia, which is don't you get to 100% live into you. And also if there is a space or an opportunity to have uh, open yourself up to the And don't do my boyfriend likes so shop. good. <laughs> <laughs> I was complaining when he put <laughs> cold water on me, so I could try to <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> yeah, like slowly but surely, and right? think about it as an exciting adventure. Fear and excitement are close to each other, you know. And I yeah. think there's nothing contraindicated in that. By measure, with benefit. <laughs> mm. Yeah. But thank you so much for being here with us today, Claudia. Appreciate you. Well, I've learned every time I learn something. <laughs> So Claudia, if I didn't, if I get it right, you have not tried ice bathing yet. That's you're curious I, about it for the veins. That's the question, right? Yes. I, I wonder because I know extreme heat, uh, mm -hmm. worsen this condition and I'm pretty sure that the extreme cold do the same. Mm -hmm. I have. There are basically some capillaries, which should now for years are very apparent, very not. No, I can't show because they're on my thigh. 
I can't. It's on my thigh. I can't. Well, Deborah, okay. I'm on you to shake your booty or your tail feathers for us. Listen, I, anyway. like, Rhonda Patrick has some good information on her on her portal around cold exposure. It's not specific to to what you're talking about with the capillaries in the veins, and also it's like. Always, I have to say, because this is the world we live in, that it's important to like, yeah, check with your doctor. But I, there are plenty of things that the Western world is saying, don't get in cold for, like Raynaud's disease, which is a circulation issue, like um, autoimmune no, conditions that I, I have seen. Problem, my no, I know, I just, this is important to say for anyone else who's listening, there's a lot, there's a lot of things that are out there in the world that we're told, no, don't get in cold because it, it's an issue. And I think with people who are in their the 11th hour being like, I just need to see if this will help. I'm going to try it once that time and time again, experientially and anecdotally, we are seeing people clean up and their bodies are healing from autoimmune, or they are at least getting in, going into a better situation with that or very nodes disease, people just almost eradicating it completely. And so, you know, I don't want to make promises, but I say, don't use it as an excuse not to try the practice unless your doctor has a serious concern about it. Yeah. So exciting. <laughs> You're going to send us photos and tag Zora and warrior woman mode. When you go in the cold for the first time, get your boyfriend to, sl to get, to get all that ice and fill up a tub for you. He's always willing. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Yeah. That would be, that would be great. We want to see that first experience. <laughs> you got a hashtag. So um, I'm going to have to let you go, Kristen, but I'm so grateful that you shared your experience. I still have a hundred more questions. We should do another one based on the breath and breath work because like that me, would be amazing. yeah, you're the oxygen advantage. Uh, well, you've done oxygen advantage, breath work training. You've done all the other breath work training too. I've only done the oxygen advantage, but we do share that as well. And it's such a key component, not only for the ice bath, but just for life and aging. Well, for life. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Are it. there any last things you want to mention uh, uh, before, uh, before I let you go? I just will say if people want to find me, Instagram is the most, um, the, the most sensational at warrior woman mode. I'm also at well power podcasts. You can find the episodes there, but at warrior woman mode is where most people are finding me. And if you're interested and curious about breath and cold exposure, whether it's just doing it, getting some insight and information, or if you have a place and a crew of people and you want to do the Sherpa breath and cold instructor training anywhere in the world. I'm going to Maui in December. How's that? Oh, um, nice. Teaching on Maui for December set seventh weekend. Is there um, any space for that? There's still? space. I just, no, I just pushed it uh, last week, last Friday. We just put it on the site. Oh, so people so can sign up for people December. People can sign up for Maui for December. It's like Hawaii, cool. here I come. And um, there's one in Connecticut in the end of September. Uh, and I'm looking at 2023, uh, Israel, Indonesia. Uh, it's just, it's really exciting to see where people are catching on to this and wanting to get trained. And if you are not wanting to go to any of those places and you want to go to SherpaBreathAndCold.com, you can look at the instructor training uh area and there's a portal and a one sheeter on it and I can come to you anyone who's listening to this and we can just rock out two full days of breath and cold exposure and I just leave you like a champion and you can go rock your own love it I will have all the links in the show notes people can find you on Facebook and Instagram so easily the warrior woman mode and that's your website as well the well power mm -hmm. podcast I'll have that link as well so um, and you've got a biohacking program for women, which is awesome. I do. And it has a module on cold and a module on breath. So if you really like, Hey, this is too much, Kristen, not trying to instruct it or coach others or like, you know, drown and no pun intended in all of the cold and breath, the women's course is a women's optimizing wellness course, like a women's biohacking course online. And it's a hybrid. We meet uh, twice a month online live and I do laser coaching and we talk about life and all the things that are needing support for each other. We are a community. And then there is a module on cold and a module on breath where you get some breath work and you get, um, I just recorded the tracks for the cold exposure module, which will launch soon up in Toronto with the other ship crew. who is amazing. I'm so excited for yeah. that. I encourage women who are interested in biohacking to really look at your program as opposed to one run by a man, because women are different than men. And I, and everybody who's following me knows that I, I am a big advocate for women and women in, in research or research being done on women. And we're finding out more and more of the sex differences. So biohacking is different for a woman. We may we have to, to adjust certain things because of our hormones and because 
our experiences in life. So I think you are the person to go to for this biohacking program. I am so grateful you're here. Thank you so much. I hope to have you again. Uh, the the message. We'll talk breath. We'll talk <laughs> breath. The message is for women in ice bathing: you're not too old for cold. Uh, you, we're all bio individual. Don't do this on your own. There are contraindications. And if you pass the test, if you're able to do it, if I, your doctor from whatever condition you have, then you're going to have some incredible benefits. So don't shy away. Yeah. So much capacity. Thanks so much for bringing your sweetness and your intelligence as po- intelligence to this platform, Zora. It's like really you're a resource for women around the world. And I so appreciate, you know, being in this space and on this journey with you. Oh, I love it. Well, I'll see you again. I have a good day. Good night. Good morning, wherever you guys are. Okay.